Welcome to the Reporters Square Table presented by Lending Tree. I'm Matt Rochinski, joined today by Sam Purley from Hornets.com, who we had on last week, as well as John Fokey, uh, the radio voice of the Charlotte Hornets. And joining us also today is WFNZ's Kyle Bailey. Great to have you on. We're excited to have you, Kyle, on episode two. Hopefully, we'll, we'll you know just keep improving on this thing. Yeah, How are you doing? Here. Appreciate the invitation. Cool. Uh, you know, there's been a lot going on, uh, you know, obviously throughout all of this hiatus right now. You know, what have you been doing, Kyle? We, we've talked about us, but what have you been doing to keep yourself busy during this break? Uh, working. I'm actually very <laughs> uh, blessed and uh, fortunate to still be working right now. There are a lot of people out there who aren't. So, um, you know, we try to keep that in mind as we go through our daily shows and you know, uh, uh, communicate with people accordingly because that, that, it, we're part of their day, but obviously the world's changed for a lot of people. So, you know, my routine hasn't changed that much. Uh, the uh, the vibe inside of our building has, and uh, we don't have as many people around. And so, uh, you know, John's experienced some of that, you know, doing some of the uh, Hornets Rapid Rewind stuff we worked on a few weeks ago that uh, it's, it's like showing up to uh, an empty building sometimes. And, you know, it's it's been a very different, uh, very different, not show so much as feel around the show and feel around the building, but uh, I think that's the same kind of experience that everybody's having right now. So, you know, again, just trying to do the best we can day to day and uh, keep listeners involved and engaged and entertained. You know, you mentioned the Hornets Rapid Rewind show. We had a chance to check that out last week. Great stuff for you guys. John, how difficult was that to kind of push everything into a one hour show for some of these amazing games? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, what what would have been great is if we just play the whole game because there are so many fun parts to uh, to each of these games. And I think that was kind of the fun challenge was going back, you know, going back with the broadcast and listening through to different points. But also, you're kind of keeping a flow sheet and you're going through the play-by-play of, of that game and saying, okay, here was a 17-0 run or what was – you know, the point where we were down the most and then started that comeback and finding those and then condensing kind of those sections down. It was a really fun experience. It was, it was challenging in that there were so many stretches of good basketball over the course of these games. And then there were parts too where, hey, the other team went on a run. And how do you balance, you know, and, and Kyle can attest to this, there were some, some shows where, you know, maybe if you tuned in, you're hearing the opposing team go on a run. And you think, well, why are we putting this in? Well, because it told the story of that game. And so finding those sections that told the story of the game. And then what, what I really loved, and, and Kyle and I had a blast with this, was those five games that we found, they not only told the story of each game, but they told the story of the season up until it was suspended. We found the themes that ran from October all the way through March. Uh, we found – where the team was improving and what were some of those storylines and we're able to use those five games to really tell what that season was up until, you know, the middle of March. And how was it for you, Kyle, working with John? I mean, we work with him every day. I know you work with him quite a bit, but man, how was it dealing with this guy? <laughs> I'm a, uh, I'm a big John Fokey fan. I'm not ashamed to say it. Uh, he and I hit it off right when he got to Charlotte and it was cool to be able to collaborate with him. Uh, he gets a lot of the credit for the legwork that he did and, and going back and, and pulling those old games and, and getting them ready. But it was fun to sit down with him because, as you know, he and I, uh, during the pregame show that I host, get to do a crosstalk segment together. And so we, you know, we got to go back and, you know, as we were looking and talking about some of these games, those memories, those images, the shots, you know, just came flooding back. And so we got really excited uh, talking about the games in a way that we, we meant to do going into it, but probably didn't know that we would when it got started because of the way that we remembered things. So, I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. You know, there's so much nostalgia that goes with recent games from this year as well as classic games going back. Got the 30th anniversary hat on, loving that, rocking that, Kyle. Uh, but, you know, when you look at these things, Sam, the, the radio and listening on the radio and kind of the impact that the voices of these guys can make, you know, talk to us a little bit about that and how you see that in, in today's day and age, you know, as we're trying to deliver on multiple mediums. <laughs> I, I think, and obviously John and Kyle can attest to this, I think radio is so cool because, and I always remember, I think it was Steve Martin said, you have to paint a picture of what's going on. You can't watch TV and have that visual sort of representation 
tell the story for you. You have to paint the picture. And I truthfully don't listen to many of his games on radio because I'm usually at the games. But I remember when I did kind of way back in the day with Steve Martin, it's like you felt like you were sitting right next to him watching it and he had was doing it for you. So that's really cool. And it's, it's almost like a lost art a little bit just because I think more everything is on TV now. There's league pass and everything. But it's a really, really cool forum that people should – keep diving into when they get the chance yeah don't let it get to your heads guys that he just called you artist i think <laughs> you know if that's what you guys want to consider yourself i don't want you walking around with a beret in the office folky okay you don't have to prove that we are an artist we get no, no, no. wouldn't do it <laughs> all right we've also seen you know on fnz you guys have been talking about a lot of the same things that everyone's been talking about and that's the last dance. Obviously, our chairman, Michael Jordan, you know, has been this focal point of this and absolutely taking over uh, the country. You know, it, it even there was an article that came out that said it, it got on top of Tiger King as the most watched documentary. And I've seen Tiger King. I'm sure you guys have, too. I'm sure, you know, so it's that's a pretty big deal right now. What do you think about this last dance and how things are going on, Kyle? It's been awesome. Uh, we have, you know, first of all, I, I was looking forward to this when we first heard about it. And then when we found out that ESPN was going to speed it up, you know, to help out the world because we were all chained to our homes, uh, even more excited. So when it came out, I knew that we, on my show, you know, afternoons two to six, I knew we'd get a lot of content out of that. Um, you know, I, pretty much every show across the country can, but especially ours, you know, like you said, with MJ being here in, in Charlotte and, you know, having the ties that we do. And it's just been incredible for me. I'm, I'm 34 years old to look back. Um, you know, that season, that 97, 98 season, I was 12 years old, you know, so I wasn't quite old enough to understand some of the things that were happening, but I was plenty old enough to remember watching those games and remember just being in awe of Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen and Phil Jackson. And so then to go back and, and to watch them tell the inside stories and to see the footage that we've never seen before, kind of like the 2012 Dream Team documentary. Uh, where we got to see the, the, the footage that no one even knew existed. It's been incredible to, uh, to not only see that and to relive it, but then to talk to people who were there. You know, and, and Wayne Larrabee, who was the voice of the Bulls for 17 years on WGN, came on with me a couple of weeks ago to talk about it. And then uh, Eric Collins, Fox Sports Southeast, told me one of the greatest MJ stories uh, that I've ever heard a couple of days ago on my show, because, of course, you guys know that uh, Eric was the sideline reporter for those Bulls teams. So, I mean, just to, to hear everybody that, that was covering them or around them or in that era come out and tell stories that we haven't heard, was it's, it's been amazing, and I can't wait. We have six more of these things to go. I can't wait, man. It's awesome. <laughs> I know. We've all said the best thing that they did was not put them all up at once, because none oh, yeah. of us would have gotten sleep on night one. That's, That's right. That's well, you know, he's, that was a great breakdown of the show in itself. Now let's talk a little bit about what we just saw last week, guys. I mean, last week was really a big eye-opener for, I think, a lot of folks to see how that old-school NBA used to be played. You know, when they were fighting the bad boys and the, and the Bulls had that rivalry, there was just it was just a crazy style of basketball. What did you think about that, Sam, when you were watching that? I know you're probably one of the youngest guys on here. Yeah, obviously that wasn't – I wasn't really alive when that happened. Or I was just born, so I didn't really know what basketball was. I know that as a team you grew up, so I'm sure you, you enjoyed those two episodes. I think the biggest takeaway was if you don't have those, those Detroit Piston teams that beat the Bulls the three straight years, do they have the success they have in the 90s? If, if they – that team forced them to do different things. It forced the weight training. It forced the physicality. It was such – I think such a big – and you saw it at the end of the – was that when they finally beat him to go to the finals to play the Lakers, it was such a weight off their shoulders. And it was so cool. It was like, we knew we were going to win the finals. We knew we were going to, we got through Detroit. We we're going to beat the Lakers. So I think it's crazy to think that those battles against the Pistons, I think set the tone for the rest of the decade it was my biggest takeaway from, I think it was episode three or four. And then the whole, the Rodman stuff as well was, was fascinating. And ESPN did their own 30 for 30 on Rodman that if, you think that is what he saw in that episode was something you watch the 30 for 30 because it, it dives even more into it. I think the good thing about watching the worm and giving that kind of background on him was that you're seeing players, our players, as a matter of fact, PJ Washington, after the episode had put out on Twitter, you know, now I know why coach Cal was always telling me to watch Rodman videos, John watching Rodman and what he did, how big of a piece was he there for them? Oh, I mean, he was huge. And, you know, I, I was a senior in high school during this run, and I loved Dennis Rodman. Like, 
the way I played basketball was I was undersized. I liked to scrap. I wasn't very good. I wasn't very talented, but I was ready to push some people around <laughs> because that was all I had. And what I love going back and watching with Rodman is the tip rebound. And it is such a lost art. I mean, now guys go in there for an offensive rebound and they just slap it back and, and try to get it out to the three-point line. And that's an art in and of itself. But what Rodman did, just tapping that ball up, tapping it up, and then well, it's in the air, fending guys off to be able to pull that down. Uh, it, it was so fun to go back and watch that because we don't see it that much anymore. Um, and, and so just, you know, this whole thing for me, is bringing back so many different memories. And, you know, my younger brother uh, was a huge Bulls fan, a huge Jordan fan. And so it's been a lot of fun texting with him during the episodes um, and remembering, oh, where we were when we were watching this game. And, you know, <laughs> we're going to jump ahead, but the shot against Utah, I remember exactly where I was. And my brother texted me as soon as this thing started. He's like, we were at Mike McDonald's uh, graduation party. I left early with mom and dad so I could go home and watch the game. I stayed and we watched that game in Mike's basement. You know, there's just, there's so many great memories that come with this. But, you know, the Rodman stuff and, and the way he rebounded, I think it really, you want to talk about artists, like that mm -hmm. man was an artist on the glass. The thing we also can pull from that answer is that John Fokey in high school brought intensity and five falls with him. Or six oh, falls, absolutely. right? <laughs> It was five in high school, and I wasn't wasting one of them. <laughs> Kyle, for you, I mean, the thing I also like about these shows is, you know, we see what happens on the basketball court, but we're also seeing what happens off the basketball court. You know, when, when Carmen Electra says, I didn't know they needed to be back after practice or things like that, those are the things that on social media are picking up and people are running with them. Are you amazed at some of the stories that are coming out of this that no one really expected? Oh, absolutely! Can you imagine if we saw uh, if you if you woke up and turned on Sports Center this or yeah this morning and there was a a video of Draymond Green walking out the back of the arena with uh, chaps on and leather and slamming a Miller Lite and getting on a, a motorcycle and just you know cruising out of the parking lot, you know they, I mean, it would be wall to wall coverage all day long. We, yeah. we didn't get those images, those visuals of uh, of Dennis Rodman and the, that crew back then. Um, I mean the fact that he was given the leeway, not only by Phil Jackson, but by Michael Jordan. I mean, Phil Jackson was the coach, but, I mean, it was clear that Dennis Dennis took his cues from Michael. And, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that both gave their blessing for Dennis just to go on a 48-hour excursion to Las Vegas to clear his head is, is mind-blowing. And then, predictably, he doesn't come back on time. MJ's got to go to his apartment to drag him out of bed. You know, MJ doesn't even want to get into what's in his bed or who's in his apartment when he gets there. <laughs> Um, I mean, just the, and then, and then again, well, I don't even know if this has been covered. I'm sure it will be when they get to the finals, but the fact that Dennis left again during the NBA finals, skipped a practice to go uh, perform in a live WCW event. You know, they just, I mean, they gave this guy all sorts of leeway because they knew how good he was. And to your point a moment ago, the fact that, you know, we, we envision guys studying film in a certain way, right? You don't have to think about guys studying film to learn how to be a better rebounder, you know, but that was part of his brilliance. And, and it was just, it was so cool. Again, to get those, those behind-the-scenes shots of Dennis sitting by himself in a chair, watching some video, taking notes, and that, that, that doesn't really align with who we envisioned Dennis Rodman to have been back then. But he was, he was crazy, but he was serious about being great, too. No, and I think it's tremendous, and the series has captured the nation. And I really appreciate you guys commenting on that. We'll, we'll pick up more on Last Dance next time. Just want to keep moving on, though, as we talk about different pieces of creative content that are being produced and ways we're having to cover things. Uh, you know, Kyle, you guys had to get really creative for the NFL draft. We have the N NBA draft that will eventually be happening. We're not sure exactly when at this point, but how much do you think that really helped to be able to do that as we kind of prepare for what might be the future this, you know, for in the next couple of months? And how much fun was that to do that? To the draft itself or our draft yeah. party? Yeah, the dr well, your draft party and being able to put everything together the way you did. That was a lot of fun for us because, you know, that, that multi-platform approach where we actually built out a digital studio right next to our traditional studio. So we could go back and forth, you know, between doors from, you know, the traditional over-the-air broadcast to the digital broadcast. And it was just a, a great way to connect with people, you know, on a Friday, well, a Thursday and Friday night. But for me, it was uh, Friday night with Mac and T-Bone where, you know, we knew people were going to be at home. You know, they might not be listening to the radio, but they might have their 
laptops or their phones in front of them and uh, want to jump in. We had a lot of people that hopped on that Zoom call to talk about the draft. And then uh, as we kind of rotated throughout the evening, uh, Mac and I did the first shift on air. And for the first hour of the show from, I think it was 7 to 8 o'clock, I mean, the lines were blowing up. People were texting in. They were all about it. And I think people really appreciated having a very Panthers-focused, uh, you know, draft production. You know, we, we covered all the picks. We talked about some of the uh, the highlight picks. But, you know, for the most part, it was primarily about Carolina. And I think people really appreciated that perspective because, I mean, you might care about the first 15, 20 picks in the draft. But for most football fans, once you get through that point, you know, you might go to a Netflix show. Or you might start to go do something else. We don't have many options right now. So people appreciated the community and the engagement. And uh, I, I think just us being there, which even you know, guys like us forget sometimes, you know, people just – it, there's, it, there's comfort and reassurance in us just being there. And I think that's what they experienced that night. Yeah, I mean, it was tremendous stuff. You know, and, and obviously we all have to get creative. You know, it's going to be a different time and, and there's different ways. And we're all going to be Zoom experts by the time this thing is over. We can all add this to our list of qualifications. There's no doubt about that. Can't control any sort of lagging or anything like that, though. That's the only thing we can't do. So Or barking dogs. <laughs> barking dogs they can also you, you may have heard george just a moment ago <laughs> well you know our producer jace darling has done a tremendous job of making sure we don't just cut to a barking dog when we hear it bark so we're in good shape here so far uh you know we've also been you know one thing that you mentioned kyle was engaging that the thing that i loved about that draft was like you said to engage those panther fans sam throughout the course of building all this content that we're building the engagement that we're seeing from fans at this point in time, it, it just really feels like fans everywhere are wanting to connect more with teams, with radio stations, with everything that's out there. Have you noticed that, Sam? Yeah, absolutely. And to kind of echo what Kyle said about the draft, it, it provided, one, it was as close to as normal a sporting event, if you can call that, as if we've had. It was a little bit different, but I think people really enjoyed sort of the different elements of it. And in terms of engagement and connectivity, I can think about over the weekend, I think I watched the entire draft for the first time ever, NFL draft, and I'm not a huge, I like college football, but I don't follow it as intently. And just being able to, I was talking to my friends and texting my friends, you know, one's a big Eagles fan, Steelers fan, and sort of that connectivity we could have about, oh, you know, Steelers on the clock, Eagles on the clock, you know, Patriots on the clock, I think was really, really cool. And I think people are really striving to find anything that makes it feel somewhat normal a little bit. And that's kind of the big thing I think we're missing about sports right now is not so much not having sports, but the connectivity and the feelings they give us. And we're looking for anything to have that. And if we can get a little taste of it like that draft had or if it's a replayed game or replayed Hornets game, I think people are really gravitating towards that right now. And it's, it's exciting to see. And, you know, hopefully we as the Hornets can kind of provide people a little bit at this you know, challenging time. Yeah, and uh, obviously the other thing I've loved seeing is the strategy and innovation and the creativity that it makes everyone kind of have to do and, and kind of lean on it and come up with different ways of doing things. And for us, as much as we miss basketball, it's provided us an opportunity to really connect with our fans in a different way and provide some different kind of pieces of content. One of my favorites was the JB cooking class we just put put up uh, last this week. So please go back and check that one out if you haven't because Coach JB with his kids in the kitchen is tremendous and, and we're hoping to have more of those going on. Uh, Kyle, you've also had to kind of pivot and you know, you've had to do some different kind of interviews, different kind of pieces. Can you just talk to us a little bit about some of those and, and your experience and how rewarding those have been? Yeah, it's been cool. Um, you know, by the way, JB, you're right. Uh, it's either, if it wasn't cooking, it had to have been bird watching because apparently he's been doing a lot of that lately. That's what he told us. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been neat to go back and, and to talk to some legends or to bring in some, you know, different interviews. Uh, like Faye Vincent, you know, former uh, commissioner of Major League Baseball. To hear that guy tell stories about, you know, being in San Francisco when the earthquake struck at Candlestick Park and, you know, he shows up in a limo with Kirk Douglas and, you know, he, he's just got the most amazing stories and, and being there that day and, you know, talking to guys like Tiki Barber or, you know, I mean, just the number of people that we've talked to. We, we got into the sports business side of it one day. Uh, and, and talking about the economic impact and fallout of COVID-19 and, and specifically the economic impact on sports. And uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Patrick Reich, who is the director of the sports business program at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. 
Um, you know, he, I'd seen him a couple of times on ESPN, on Outside the Lines. I knew he was good. And I, I saw that he did a, uh, a piece with Mina Kimes for ESPN's New Daily podcast. And I thought, well, let me get this guy on the show and, and let's chat. So I called him up and uh, I already knew he was good on the air. And I said, hey, I want to get you on this afternoon. He said, that'd be fantastic. I went to UNC Charlotte. And I said, no way. And he said, yeah, no, that's home for me. And so, you know, we've just having a little bit of freedom, you know, to reach out to some different people now has been awesome. And, and to uh, have some different conversations, it's led to some great connections. And, you know, I think, again, there, there's a baseline just kind of gratitude and relief that people have right now that we're on the air every day to provide some sense of normalcy. And so then to be able to kind of step out of the box and do some things like that, uh, people have really enjoyed it and appreciated it because they understand the predicament that we're all in right now, that uh, we're all kind of at a pause and, you know, there, there aren't games to talk about and recap from last night. So uh, we're having to get creative. Now, one thing we will have games to talk about soon is the Ely and the Hornets Venom GT. The schedule is being announced. They're starting, you know, next week. It's something that we've all had an opportunity to kind of dive into. Uh, John, you know, how excited are you about the start of the Venom season in, for right now? Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, obviously, last year at the beginning of uh, – of the E-League season, I was in Minnesota, and T-Wolves Gaming went on to win the championship. So it was really fun at, at the beginning of the year, uh, before I moved to Charlotte, to get to know some of those guys. And of course, Nacho, uh, who was with that team, is now with Hornets Venom. So uh, it was great to see him and, and chat about the team. But I had a chance, as you guys know, to call a couple of those games and watch uh, some of the preseason stuff and some of the tournament stuff on Twitch. Uh, this team is fun. I love the court. I love the uniforms. Uh, I, I've chatted with a number of the guys over, over the weeks, you know, from when they got to Charlotte up until just recently. Uh, fun guys. I think it's, it's a really cool uh, – it, it's a really cool way to follow the game. And then, I, I mean, honestly, like we discussed, I'm not a gamer, so I, I didn't know much about it. I learned a lot last year when I was getting ready uh, for that T-Wolves gaming season. And since then, and having watched it and called it, man, it's awesome. I mean, it is as close to real basketball as you're going to see right now. Uh, there's strategy to it. There's, there's skill to it. There's different things. Uh, that as The more you watch it, the more you pick up on it. So I, I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, I can't wait to get this thing started. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I think the best part, too, is the guys are characters. You know, these guys – They've got great personality. They're fun to talk to, and uh, just looking forward to, to tipping that thing off. Kyle, have you had a chance to check out any of this? And how excited are you about the start of this 2K league? Are you a gamer? I'm not. Um, I was, uh, you know, a little bit back in the day, but uh, most of the time, when, once I got to college, I was probably just, you know, watching my roommates play more than anything else uh, while waiting to go out. So, no, I, I haven't played in, in a long time, but I do think it's great the way that it's grown you know, for a lot of reasons, because people do love it. And, you know, it, it does create a, create really unique opportunities for people. And obviously, you know, it creates income in certain instances. And, you know, people do this for a living now, which is really cool. And, and I think the, the synergy with the NBA, um, you know, and the, the fact that the NBA skews younger than a lot of sports mm -hmm. leagues do, it, it makes all the sense in the world. So, you know, John said it best a second ago. I mean, I, I'm open-minded enough to say, hey, I'm not a gamer, but people do tend to love this uh, in, a, in a big, big way. So I'm open to learning and uh, excited to see where this goes. And Sam, you've been a big part of this continuously throughout this whole process. And, and kind of to Kyle's point, I think that it's opening itself up because of the situation we're in now where folks who might not have been paying as much attention to it before are definitely paying attention to it now. And it's creating maybe a whole new level of fandom, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I guess I started, I think I got brought on with the team last March and for the June announcement of the team. And when I started, we didn't even have a logo. We just had a name and that was it. To see this thing kind of come from the ground floor. And I came in sort of even later in that process. So to see it kind of come from the ground floor and there was some initial disappointment, obviously, when the season got postponed. But now that it's, you know, they're going to play remotely and getting to know some of the guys. And I'm, I'm super excited for them that they finally get a chance to compete. And yeah, I think everybody's looking for stuff to do right now. And I think non-gamers are becoming gamers at this point. And I, kind of echoing back what we said about the draft, anybody's looking for some sort of thing to kind of keep themselves entertained, to be engaged. And, you know, again, to echo what John said, it's, it's very much like real basketball. There's real strategy. Guys are setting screens, picks, everything. Like it's not just going out there and, 
you know, you know, a couple buddies in the basement and just seeing who wins. I mean, there's a real strategy and it's, it's a fascinating um, thing to cover. And I'm, I'm super excited to kind of get it going just because it's something I've never tackled before and to see where it can go. So uh, hopefully more people can follow along as well. Well, thank you guys all for your takes today. Great stuff uh, that's going on everywhere that everyone is doing. Kyle, you guys over at WFNZ, keep up the tremendous work. To your point, sometimes I think people just need to hear a, a voice that makes them feel comfortable, something that's familiar. And hopefully by doing a show like this too, we're also bringing that to some of our Hornets fans and we'll have more folks on here as well. But thank you very much, Sam, for joining us. John, for joining us as always. Kyle, you're tremendous. All the guys at the FNZ, we give a big shout out to them. Uh, just a reminder, all of our fans, that you can purchase masks right now on HornetsFanshop.com. If you don't have one of those, get on there. All the proceeds are donated to charity. It's just an absolutely great thing that we have going on right now. Thanks to you all for joining us. Please make sure you stay safe, stay home, and we'll see you next time on the Reporters Square Table, presented by Lending Tree.